So, hello everyone. Welcome to DrupalCon. Hope you are having a great time. Uh, this is Drupal 8 Multilingual APIs, building for the entire world. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the keynote, and the, the pre-keynote and the note. Uh, so what we are going to talk here is about uh, code, because it, this is part of the code and development track, not site building. If you are interested in the site building parts of the multilingual improvements in Drupal 8, there's a lot of uh, sessions that we've been doing in the past and they are recorded in Drupal 8 multilingual.org. And you can even find a full workshop guide, three hours workshop guide with a multilingual demo distribution, distribution that you can use. So you can check all the improvements and learn more about it. But today we are going to talk about code. So my name is Christian Lopez. I'm Peñasquito on Drupal.org. And uh, I've been contributing to the Drupal 8 multilingual initiative. So in how many of you have built uh, Drupal 8 multilingual, Drupal 7 multilingual sites? Quite a lot, if not everyone. Uh, how many of you have already built uh, Drupal 8 sites? And multilingual Drupal 8 sites? So, okay, so quite a lot, like more than half of the room. So if you remember, which you probably do, uh, multilingual was an afterthought in Drupal 7. So there was not really good support out of the box with Drupal core. So you needed to use a lot of uh, contributed modules. And in Drupal 8, uh, this was thought that it wasn't ideal. So there was a good investment of people who wanted to work on that and make it the situation better. So I'm presenting this here, but this is the work of a lot of people. So please thank them. And if you find them around the conference, hug them. So <clears throat> Drupal 7 multilingual, the situation is that you had a Drupal core and the support. Uh, you needed the loca locale module for allowing people to to add a list of languages and making them possible to, to provide a user interface translations. And you had to download them manually, which if you have like 50 modules in four languages, you need to download 2200 PO files that you have to import on your site, which can be quite a painful task. So then the community build the localization update module, which does that automatically for you. And then you want to translate your content and you need to install the content translation module, which makes uh, copies of your notes for each language. But then you have your menus and you have uh, taxonomy terms. So you need to install the internationalization suite, which has modules like the IATN, uh, terms and a lot of models that help you to translate your site. And then you want to translate your title in your site, your site name, and you need the variable model for that. And uh, maybe you want to make money online, and then you, you build, uh, you use uh, Drupal Commerce, and Drupal Commerce has entity translation for for translating your products, which was a country module that appeared later. And this uh, module, instead of doing copies of your nodes, it translates uh, each field. But then you find out that uh, the title of your entities or, and your nodes is not really uh, a field. So you need to install the title module. So at the end, you, you end up like having 40, 50 country modules installed on your site for translating all your data. And you have multiple solu solutions for translating the same content. So if you, you may have nodes and you may be translating them with content translation, but maybe you can also do it with entity translations and you have your taxonomies and your taxonomy terms can be translation with the IDN suite, but you can also use the entity translation 
So there were a lot of options. And at the end, you can mix them all. And it can be quite confusing. And your, your site becomes uh, highly harder to manage. So this is something that we wanted to solve in Drupal 8. And for that, uh, we introduced uh, four modules in Drupal 8. Each, with, each of them has like a very concrete task. And we are going to see uh, a short summary of them. So the first one is the language module. In Drupal 7, you had uh, the locale module. And it allows you to add languages to your site and to translate the user interface. Now we split that in Drupal 8. So we have the language module, which provides services for dealing with data and which language your data is in. And it's useful not only for multilingual sites, also for monolingual sites, because you may want to install uh, in Spanish and you want to track which data your site is on, because maybe you want to add more languages later or, or you want to, to separate uh, to know which language your data is in. The second module, the second pi pillar, is the interface translation module, which uh, allows you to translate your user interface. And uh, before you, we needed the, the localization update module for downloading your PO files and man man automatically. So now this is in core already, so you can use interface translation module, and it has this available there, and it improves the usability a lot. Then we have the content translation module, which allows you to translate all your content, not only notes and taxonomy terms, but also any kind of entity that you can have in your site. If you have Drupal Commerce, it can translate your products. And provides the user interface for actually translating them. And then we have the config translation module. And uh, in Drupal 8, we introduced the config management system, which allows you to uh, move configuration around different environments or share them with different sites. So we actually need to translate this configuration too. And the config translation uh, module uh, allows you to translate your blogs, your views, your field settings, and it provides a unif unified translation UI, and it looks like the content translation one. So starting with the language module, we are going to see which APIs we have available here. So the first thing we want to do is we need to deal with the languages. And for that, we have a service, which is the language manager. And even in, if you don't install any module, this is part of core, so you can actually use it. You don't even need to, to install the language module. You have a language manager available. Because for dealing with languages, we needed to, to put that in there. So, so we can uh, manage the data, the language of our data, even if it's in English only. So calling the Drupal language manager returns a, a language manager object, which is a service that you can use for tracking and managing your language. But if you install the language module, this same call will return a configurable language manager. And they share the same interface, so you can check this, you can uh, call the same methods on them. The way that you, you, don't really to be, you don't really know to be aware if you have a, a multilingual site or a monolingual site when you are dealing with the APIs from your country or custom models. Uh, so one of the most important methods that our language manager has is the get language method, with if you don't have language model enabled, it has three languages. The default, which will be English, as it used to be in, in Drupal 7. And in Drupal 7, we had a, a special language, which was the UND language, which was somehow confusing for people. So now we, we added a new one, which is the not applicable language, so we can maybe double the confusion. 
So actually, the difference is that the, in our site, we may have data, which is in a language, which may be English in this case, if we didn't install a language model. But we may want to track uh, the language of data when a language doesn't make sense. So we may have users that are loading content, and we don't know the language of this content, and they don't select it. Maybe we are automatically retrieving it from somewhere. And then we would assign the not a specified language, like we don't know the language of this data. Uh, but there's also the possibility that we are uploading an image, and the image has no text on it, so actually the language doesn't make sense there. So in that case, we would be using the not applicable language. And if we install the language model, uh, we can actually use different languages. So in this case, we will have Hungarian and Italian, and we still have the two uh, special languages, not specified and not applicable. Uh, this, if we install the configurable, the language model, uh, our language will be configurable, so we can edit them, add them, anything you can do with languages. And they are actually, uh, they are actually config objects, so you can deploy them and anything, so they are saved like any other config entities in the system, and you can export them to, to a YAML file. And in our, in our interface, when you pick the language you are using, in some cases it doesn't make sense that you see the not specified or the not applicable languages, so they are special, and we don't want you to edit them or delete them, so they are locked. And this is something that you can see when you export your, your, config and your configurable languages you will see that they have a locked property. And your regular languages are not locked. <clears throat> so how we deal with languages, how we can create languages. So, uh, if you have the language model installed, you will have a configurable language class, which has a create uh, method, so you can create your languages, but if you want to use the 95 standard languages that come with Drupal, so you don't want to provide their native names or their names, you only need to provide the, to use the lang code they will be used, so you call configurable language, create from lang code, you pass the lang code, and then you can save them. Uh, but if you want to have your own languages, you can just call the constructor of this class and save it in the same way. Uh, you can do whatever you want with languages, so you can load them, you can edit them, you can delete them uh, through the APIs, and it works exactly the same. The API will look exactly the same that the API you would use like dealing with nodes. And uh, another thing that the language module does is that it detects the language you are requesting in your page. Uh, and if you need to deal with the language that is being used currently in this request, you can use the language manager get current language method for that. And it will return the current language object. So in summary, uh, you, languages are op configurable uh, entities, so you can do CRUD operations on them. You can also get the language which is been, being negotiated on the page, and you can do whatever you need with them from the APIs, like you can edit them, assign, uh, change their name, which may be not that common, but you can do whatever you want. So now that we have languages on our site, the next logical step is translating the user interface. And for that, you may remember for, from Drupal 7, the T function, that uh, is still there, and in most of the cases is all you want to know about how to translate your user interface. So we could say that there's no, chain, no, no change and we just leave the room, but actually internally it's really different. 
And you may not want to use that one, actually, because in Drupal 8, we introduced this concept of dependency injection. Who is aware of dependency injection? Half of the room. So usually in our, before Drupal 8, in Drupal 7, what we usually did is like we had our logic in our code and we need to know about the user that is in our site so we, we could call uh, methods for dealing with the users and we need to know the configuration of our site because we may have a user that has a different preference about language. We may want to know the configuration of the language on our site and then we need to actually call the translation uh, functionality. So with dependency injection, what we are doing is just reversing the arrows and in some way we provide when we have a, a class or a service that is uh, dealing with any logic, what we want is to know which other parts of the system it depends on. And the, a good way of knowing this is like, instead of having uh, calling external code, what we do is that in, we inject, we pass through the constructor or any other ways, we pass the dependencies they need so they keep an instance of a reference of them so they can actually call them. One good thing about this is that we can switch them if we have a, an interface and we know that we need to know some data about the user and we know that there's a method for that. Uh, we don't really need to know which user system is we are using. Maybe we are integrating with an external system and it, it provides the user, so we don't really need to know about the details of that. We just know that there's a contract and this service will use that contract so we know which methods there will be and we don't really need to know what they are doing. So here uh, we want to have a way of having this so we don't really need to know if even there's a translation system in place because we may be in a monolingual site and actually we want like the language we, we saw before the language manager can be different if you are in a monolingual site or if you have the language model installed. So we need a way to provide this translation service and a way that we can switch it and for that uh, what we will use is the this T method. So if we are creating a controller or a form, we are probably standing from base classes that are available in Drupal 8 core, like a form base. And it will already have a T, a T method that we can use. So we will be calling the this T function instead. And it will call the, translation, the proper translation service and it will call the T function on, on that one. But uh, if we are creating our, our own class that doesn't extend from anything else in the Drupal system, we can actually use the string translation trait. So we don't have to repeat our code about creating the T method and, and storing this reference to the translation uh, service. So this uh, string translation trait will be providing us with the reference to the translation service and it will provide the T, the D3 function that we want to use. And as we said, uh, T is actually the same as Drupal 7, this T, but Internally is quite different, so when we call T in Drupal 7, we get the string translated. In Drupal 8, we actually are getting an object. So we are getting a translatable markup object, and we can call methods on it. So we can actually, if we call T in this, in this string, we can actually check which option, the land code option and we have several methods for knowing about this uh, translation. This way we can even alter uh, how this would be translated, translated later before the output is actually created 
and we can avoid and we, we could even avoid operations. So uh, if in Drupal seven, if we had a T call which returns a translation, and then in maybe in a form alter later we are not dealing, we are not really printing that uh, string. We we had to translate it here. If it's not going to be rendered, we are not really translating it. So at the end, we may even make the performance of our site better. So this is only, the translation is actually only done when we are going to render the HTML of the page. In the same way, we had format plural in Drupal 7. Now in Drupal 8, it's gone. So we have the this format plural method for that. And, and it will work the same way. So you, you call the format plural and you will get an object that you can actually alter or whatever you need. And if you are doing JavaScript, it didn't change that much from Drupal 7. We still have the Drupal T method and the Drupal format plural method. So for templates, uh, now in Drupal 8 we have Twig, and we usually had PHP template before. So you would call T on your PHP templates. Now we don't have that anymore. So what we have is there are two different methods for translating your, your strings, uh, your literals in your templates. So the first one is the trans filter. which you can, if you have a string, you can pass the trans filter and it will provide the proper translation. And like in the T function in Drupal 7, we, have, we can pass uh, the context for maybe we want to request the translation, not in the current language, but in a special language, defined language. And if you use the first way, it can be quite complex to read. So there's another way, which is using the trans uh, tag, like you can see down, downside there. And this makes that the, all the text that is between the trans and n trans will be uh, used for calling the T function internally. So, and you can also have like variables there, like you would have in, in your PHP code. Another special thing is that in Drupal 7, you had the, your hook menu, where you had your routes, you had your links, you had your menu links, your tasks, everything was in there. Now we split that, and these are all located in YAML files. They are separated, so we have your menu links in one side, your routing is in a different place, and you can, it's a more flexible system. And in Drupal 7, uh, one thing you couldn't do is in your hook menu, you shouldn't be calling the T function for your title because it, it, this way it would be possible to, to cache your links. And Drupal would take care of translating those. In Drupal 8, it's mostly the same, and actually they are YAML files, so you can actually, you cannot call any function on them. But what we have here is that we have some special keys that Drupal 8 will take care of translating. And if uh, and the POTX module, the POTS module, will take care of extracting them and making them available like for provided configuration and provided links from core, you want to translate them in localized Drupal.org maybe. So this model takes care of knowing which uh, keys from these YAML files should be translated or not. So in this case, we will have the title and the description, and they will be translated for you by Drupal 8. So this was about the interface APIs, the interface translation APIs. So at the end, the interface translation uh, module what it does is that it provides the ability to translate from English to any other language. And now, uh, next uh, module is the content translation module. 
And as we said before, it's not based on copies of your nodes or your entities. So what we have here is that we, ha we will have clever objects that know about them. So if you are creating your own uh, entity content entity types, uh, Drupal 8 would make easier to translate them. So actually, uh, for creating a content entity type, what you need to do is create a class in a special namespace in your, in your module, and you have an annotation which describes the metadata of, uh, it defines what your content entity, how it will behave. So here we have the node PHP uh, from core, and there we have a content entity type with, with, with the ID node, then we want to provide a label, and it's uh, and for translating your labels in annotations, you can use the translation this add translation, and it will uh, provide the it will be extracted so you can translate them on your UI, and for translating your con your content itself, you only need to say that uh, this flag translatable is true, and if you want to translate your entities you need to know which language they are in. So you need to define the LAN code uh, in the entity keys uh, array. And so just by, by doing this, and you are actually telling Drupal that these entities are translatable or that a, that a user could opt in for translating them. So this doesn't mean that the, all your nodes can be translatable. This means that the user can uh, go to the language content interface and set up if they want to translate them or not. And as we said, we need a LAN code uh, field for that in our, in our entity. In Drupal 8, as in Drupal 7, we have two different kind of fields. So first one is that the, the fields that are defined as part of the entity, and then we have the fields that we can add to an, that we can configure in the interface of the entity. So if we are standing from content entity base when creating our content entities, which we may, we should do, uh, we have to define the base field definitions, which provides these uh, base properties that every entity of this kind will have. And it already has the code for creating the field for you, the LAN code field for you. So you only need to, in the entity keys, uh, write, define that you have a LAN code, uh, and you have to provide the name that you want to use for this field. And if you extend and call the base field definition method, they will be created for you. So in your definition, when you are creating your entity, you only need to ensure that you call the parent base field definition method, uh, and you use the fields from there, and then you can add your own fields. So for your own fields, uh, you will, you can, you need to create the, the base field definition from there, and then you have the, a method for making them translatable. What this makes, again, is, is not that they are translatable, is that the user can set them up as translatable. And it will provide, if we call the set translatable method in our base properties, Drupal will know about it, and actually it will provide uh, defaults for, same defaults for that, so, the user can configure them, but if you make an entity translatable, any field that have this flag on will be translatable by default. And if we are creating our own fields, how we can make them translatable? There's nothing you need to do. Actually, they will be translatable <coughs> automatically. So Drupal 8 knows uh, how to make them translatable, but at some point, you may want to make uh, more granular options. Like uh, next example, we have we are defining an image field here. Uh, this is another example from Core. And in our field, in our image, we will have a file, 
which uh, is the a file an, an entity reference to a file entity actually and we want to know the width and the height of this image and then we want to define the alternative text and the title of the of this image so a field can be composed of different sub properties and we may want to provide different uh, translatability options for them so in case of an image you probably don't want to translate the image itself but you want to translate the alternative text and the title. So what we have here is that in our annotation, we can actually create groups. Like here, we are creating a file group, and we are saying that the columns of this group, uh, target ID, width, and height, are part of this file, and we don't say anything about translatability. And for the alternative text, we are saying translatable, translatable true. What this makes is that uh, it will provide same defaults for when you are configuring your site. So when you check translating an image file, an image field in an entity, you will see uh, by default that you can provide different configuration for the file itself, for the alternative text, and for the title. And by default, the alternative text and the title will be translatable, but not the file itself. But you can actually make it translatable if you want. So this is how you deal with your, with your own entities, how you make your own entities translatable, and how you can uh, provide more granular options for translatability of your fields. So then we are going to see how you actually uh, manage your your entities. So the entity language API is quite uh, straightforward. So you have a node uh, class for dealing with your nodes, but you probably will have you will have the same for any kind of entity that you may create. And you have a load method for it. So you can load your entity, and then you can call the get translation method. So if you call the get translation method. You, will, you can request which translation you want to work with, and you will get a reference to, to the translation, but it's actually another node. It's the same node, so you can do any operations you want with it, and then save it or edit the, the fields as you work with uh, nodes in any other situation. So language here is uh, quite easy to, to use, and translations from these, uh, from these notes are quite easy to use. And if, as before we said, we may not, wa we may not know which uh, translation we want, like we may want the translation from the current language that has been negotiated. So in that case, what we would use is from the entity repository, we will call the get translation from context method and we pass the node and what we get there is the node in the current ne negotiated language. So there are a lot of functions or a lot of methods that we can use in our entities. So we have a get and translated method that gets us the source translation. The node originally was created in the language that it was originally created. We can get the language object from the node, calling the language method. We can see which uh, languages this node has been translated to with the get translation languages. We get the list of the language objects. Uh, we have the has translation method for knowing if there's a translation for a specific uh, land code, the add translation for actually creating it, and remove translation for removing them. So these are the APIs that Content Translation provides for, for dealing with uh, your language and your Content Translation. So, but one thing is that in Drupal 8, uh, BUS is in core, and its language support uh, has been improved a lot. So the purpose of BUS is actually, it has two different functionalities. One is making queries to the system, so you can uh, query the system about your data, 
and then render it. And these are the two different columns that you can see in the views, views UI. So, and language is quite integrated in, in views. So, in the query part, you can actually filter by language. So, you can actually filter your views by a specific language, or you can say, I want to filter by the language which is actually negotiated for the page. And in the rendering side, you can actually pick which language you should render your entities. So you can actually, with views, do give me all the nodes that are in English and then render the German translations. So this is like a different, uh, the two different ways that you deal with language in views and it's quite powerful, so you may even not need these APIs at all. So this was about uh, content translation. So w what it provides is the ability for translating from any language to any other language. And your entities are intelligent objects, so you can actually call the methods on them for getting the translations, for dealing with translation, adding translations, and anything. So the next module is the config translation module. In Drupal 8, we have uh, two kinds of configuration, configuration, configuration objects and configuration entities for those objects which we can have a lot of them and we don't know how much, like languages. And we are going to see how we can actually translate them. So uh, our configuration is uh, stored in YAML files. And what we do here is that we have our, our a property in our configuration which is the LAN code, and there any configuration object will have the LAN code this is in. And for knowing, uh, for making our config translatable, what we need is to provide a schema, which uh, it was introduced in Drupal 8 actually for translating your for knowing how to translate or dealing with languages in your configuration, but it has actually used for, for a lot of other things. So here we are defining a config object and then we say that it has a LAN code. And these are the data types from the core. So we have a LAN code which will be a string and it's the language code. And then we have another type of um, data type which is a text which it will be a string that it's actually translatable. Another thing that this config schema provides is that when you are calling your objects from PHP, because you have the config schema, you know the data types that this data is in. So if you have an integer in your config uh, and you, call, you load your configuration from PHP, uh, it will be automatically cast in PHP. So you already will have an integer. So for creating your own schemas, you need to create a, in the folder config a schema for module. You create a schema YAML file. And here you define the type of your configuration fields. So here we are defining, a, we are defining the system maintenance object and we are saying that it's a config object. This means that it will have a LAN code. And then uh, we are defining its uh, attributes that there, are in the, that there are in this config object. Like in this case, we have a message, and we know it's a text, so it will be tra a translatable string. So our config will look like this. We will have the message, and we will have a LAN code. And then when we translate this, uh, in our config folder, we will have a language folder, and then we will have a, the lang a folder for its, lang why? For, for its language with the LAN code as a name, and then we will have a, a file with the same name. And the properties that we are going to translate are the only ones that we will have there. So if we have a Hungarian site and we have the system maintenance, a message, we will have a language HU system maintenance YAML where, where we will have this uh, 
message translated. Same for Italian. So how we deal with this configuration? So when we want to know the configuration of our site, we have the Drupal config service, and we pass the, the name of the configuration object that we want to retrieve, and then we can access their properties with, with the get method. So we can get the message from the system maintenance object. And if we have language overrides, uh, they will apply as appropriate. So if we have uh, this config object is translating it, and we are in a and we are in a Hungarian uh, in the and the language negotiated for our page was Hungarian, we will get the message in Hungarian. So this is how you usually will use your configuration from your system. Uh, if you have a settings PHP and you are overriding some config there and you call the Drupal config method, you will get these overrides applied to. So there are different kinds of configuration that, that you may want to deal with. So because this Drupal config method uh, has the overrides applied, uh, we don't actually, we cannot actually edit them. It's mostly for reading configuration about the system. But if we want, maybe we want to get the configuration in a given language that we want, we know which language configuration we want. So then what we need to use is the language manager, which knows about languages. And it will, we can call the com, get config override language uh, for, for storing the language that we are currently using, then you can set a different one if we want to use a concrete one, like here, set config override language. And then uh, calling the Drupal config will actually uh, give us the configuration for a Hungarian, uh, for the Hungarian side. So this can be quite useful if we are sending emails so the user may be uh, visiting, maybe an, an, an admin is visiting your site, your admin interface in English, and it's mailing users, but you want the users to get the emails in the language they prefer. So this way you can actually get the language from the user object, uh, set the config override, then call the config for getting the string of the email that you want to send, and you will get the translated uh, version of this email for that user preference. And then you can set it back to the original language that you were using. So we have three different ways for dealing with languages with configuration. The first one is the system Drupal config. This provides your configuration with every uh, overhead apply, so they are applied you will have like a priority system, so any kind of override will be overriding the previous one, so you pile your configuration values. Then we have the Drupal config factory, get editable for getting the, actual, the current configuration in the original language, so no overrides apply. This is useful mostly if you are creating your own config forms. And then we have, a, as we saw, we have another method for getting a concrete configuration object if we know the language we want from it, which is the Drupal language manager get language config override. So we can get the override, the config with all the overrides. We can get the config as raw data with no overrides. Or we can actually ask the system for getting a concrete override. So summarizing, uh, the config translation module allows to translate your configuration from any language to any other language. And in difference with uh, the content translation module where you had intelligent objects, here you mostly have uh, arrays that they are, if there are uh, config overrides, they are going to be merged, but you are actually using arrays. So the APIs are maybe not that uh, beautiful as the content translation ones. So this was 
I hope you like the different APIs that we have. This was the work of a lot of people, so please thank them if you find them around. And thanks also to Gabor Hoitzi, which uh, part of this presentation is based in a previous presentation, and he's the initiative lead, which uh, did uh, an amazing work on making languages better in Drupal 8. And if you like it, but maybe you want to improve it, or maybe you think that it could be quite better, you are welcome to join us in the contribution sprint. Uh, there will be workshop for five time sprinters, so anyone is welcome, no matter your experience. So please drop by. And there will be mentor course sprint where we can uh, help each other to improve Drupal and the general sprints too, if you already know what to work on. So that was it. Thank you very much for attending. If there are questions, there is a mic there. So. Hello. Hello. I have a question concerning performance. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know how does it scale when you enable a couple of or dozens of uh, languages and when you work extensively with revisions? Um, how does it work in the background and in the database? You know, does the node load take them longer? Does it load every all translation at once? Or does it only load uh, on the, trend, the languages on demand? So uh, the quest, so the translations, the different revisions. So when you load a node, you are actually loading the last revision that is published, and for the and you are actually loading the current language of uh, the language negotiated for that page, and you are getting that object. And when you access a different translation these are actually queried to the system. So when you load a node, you are not loading all the translations, but you are loading the current language one or the one that you are asking for. Does that answer your question? No? Thanks. So related to that, does that mean that the uh, the cache tag metadata includes the language component? Yes, so when you load, okay, so the question is about uh, how the caching, caching works uh, in Drupal. So in Drupal 8, we have this new caching metadata, which allows you to provide different tags that you can then invalidate. So when you load a node, uh, this node is actually cached. And the question is how language applies to that. So when you, are, when you are loading a node, the language that you are requesting is actually provided as a cache tag. So you can invalidate. Uh, you can actually cache your nodes by the language you are requesting, and then you can invalidate the concrete translation that you want to. Thank you. So if there are not more questions, thank you for coming. Please evaluate the session and enjoy the conference. Thank you.